Hey guys, welcome back to Nifty Invest. In a recent video by financial expert Rafi Farber, he delves into the intriguing concept of silver's role as money, challenging the prevailing notion that silver is not currently functioning as a monetary metal. Farber presents a compelling analogy involving astronauts in a zero-g environment, drawing parallels to how silver operates as money even though it may not feel like it. The video explores historical instances, specifically in 1919, 1968, and 1980, where silver has returned to its original bimetallic ratio with gold, signaling a recurrent pattern of public trust in silver as a form of money during economic uncertainties. Farber emphasizes that silver's relevance as a monetary metal becomes apparent when there's a lack of trust in gold derivatives or the broader financial system. While a perfectly honest and efficiently managed gold derivative would render silver unnecessary, the reality of potential issues with gold derivatives prompts individuals to turn to silver during times of monetary panic. Farber suggests that when trust in gold diminishes, a rush to silver often follows, citing historical precedents. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. Functionally right now, it is not a monetary metal. I'm not arguing that people actually use silver as money. Um, but the analogy that I use is, um, and I have this on my, on my Substack in an article uh, called The Myth of Silver Demonetization. Imagine you're on an airplane. How they train astronauts in a zero-G environment, right? They, uh, they put them in airplanes and then they, they nosedive the airplane or make it go down really fast at a sharp angle. And then there's, it's, it's like zero-G in the airplane. But why is that? Because everyone, everything's falling just as fast as you are. So is there gravity on the airplane? Yeah. Does it feel like there's gravity in the airplane? No. So does silver feel like it's a money? No. But is it actually a money? Yeah, it, it still is. And we there there is proof of this uh, <clears throat> because three times since silver was demonetized in 1873, three times since then it has returned to uh, the the original bimetallic ratio with gold, which was 15.5 to one, something something between 15 and 16 to one historically. I don't remember the exact number, but three times it's happened, right? In 1919, post World War One, it happened in 1968 when the gold when the London gold pool fell apart, and it happened in in 1980 when there was a dollar panic. So that that means the 15 to one ratio means that that the public is returning to silver as money, and why would that be? Well, there's no, there's really no need for silver when you have a functioning gold derivative. Let's let's say that we had the perfectly honest Federal Reserve or whoever to manage the the dollar, and they printed it one one to one at a constant ratio uh, with the gold that was mined, and everything was 100% honest and perfect, right? So then there would be no need for silver as a monetary metal at all. Uh, you could just use the the dollar the dollar derivative the the gold derivative. But when when the people start to suspect or understand, you know that uh, that the gold derivative is not honest anymore, then yeah, they will they will buy gold, and they will also buy silver because if a gold derivative doesn't work, you're gonna you're gonna need silver for retail purchases because gold coins won't work. And I'm not saying that it's like the average grocery shopper. Retail level grocery shopper says, "Oh, well, I have to buy silver now." It, it, this happens in it, you know, in the plumbing, in the deeper recesses through the through the Fed's balance sheet. But um, basically, what I'm saying is that whenever there is a dollar panic, and because the dollar is explicitly a gold derivative now, even though statutorily it's not, but functionally it is because of the regression principle. And if you if you've heard me speak about that before, you understand. Uh, then. <clears throat> Uh, then it, once the the gold once the trust in gold goes the 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 rush to silver begins. We've seen it three times. We'll see it again. Exactly when we don't know, but the focal point of Farber's analysis is the 15 to one gold to silver ratio, historically significant during monetary panics. He advises viewers not to fixate on the exact ratio, but emphasizes the importance of paying attention when it approaches, signaling a shift in public perception of silver as a store of value. Farber stresses that, in such scenarios, the objective isn't to accumulate profits in dollars, but to secure tangible assets and goods, as the demand for dollars wanes. Farber discusses the most recognizable forms of silver, 
leaning towards constitutional 90% junk silver for its widespread recognition. He advises against overly numismatic coins, favoring bullion coins of one's own country or any nationality in emergencies. As global uncertainties, including geopolitical tensions, unfold, Farber provides a thoughtful perspective on the potential consequences and the importance of holding physical assets. The point is, what are the, what's what's the end game ratio? The end game ratio is the 15 to 1 gold to silver ratio. That is a monetary panic. No matter what the dollar numbers for these metals are, one sort of 15 to 1, that's the bell. That's when you got to start spending. You have to get that out of our heads that once we reach a 15 to 1 ratio again, not exactly 15 to 1, I'm not saying wait for that number and then spend everything, but once we get closer to it, like 25, 20, you start spending. Uh, at that point, I don't think the dollar is going to be acceptable in in commerce, really. Maybe in the same in the same way that maybe a, a peso in Argentina is acceptable because someone's going to exchange it immediately for dollars. Like a dollar might be acceptable because somebody who's going to accept it is going to exchange it immediately for silver. Uh, but you'll want the silver directly. Uh, so yeah, it's not like you were going. The point isn't to buy silver at let's say twenty five dollars and then sell it at I don't know whatever three hundred whatever it's going to be and then take the dollar profits and then you're going to be rich, right? That's not going to be the environment. The environment is going to be when nobody wants dollars. So who cares about what dollar profits you're going to make? You want the stuff so you can buy things for your life, right? We're not we're not going to be exchanging them back into dollars. We're going to be buying things with them because they are money. So then what is the most recognizable form of money? It's probably going to be constitutional 90% junk silver because people will still recognize dollars, sorry, they'll recognize half dollars, quarters, dimes, uh, those kinds of coins, American. I mean, if you have junk silver of your of your local country, then you know probably uh, if, uh, I know in, in Australia they had silver coins until 1966, so you wanna get those. And uh, those have very low numismatic value, which I think is good for, for spending money because it, nu, nu, numismatics are basically art. And there's nothing wrong with art, but you, you know, you're not going to be buying food with art. You're going to be buying food with money. And uh, so I would, I would get away from numismatics. Um, if you collect them, that's fine. But I uh, know you're collecting art. And uh, bullion coins, uh, preferably of, of your country, but I'm sure that you know 100% bullion coins of any of any uh, nationality will work in an emergency. I don't think it's going to be that much of a problem. What's happening in Israel, and I, I don't I don't really know exactly what is happening because I don't trust what I read, but I can tell you what I read, and you can either take it at face value or or assume it's all lies, but. Um, they keep extending the timeline here of how long it's going to take for them to achieve their objectives. I don't know what their objectives are. Um, I'm dealing with questions from friends of mine who have kids that are being called up, like 18, 19. Sorry, no, like like uh, just uh, after the mandatory three-year service, so it's like 22, 23-year-old kids that are going to be called up for their first reserve duty and go and take the Gaza Strip. Shifting gears, Farber briefly touches upon the unfolding events in Israel, expressing concerns about the prolonged conflicts and the potential consequences of a protracted war. He hints at a potential economic fallout and underscores the importance of forming local communities, knowing trustworthy individuals with essential skills, and being prepared for uncertain times. Farber's advice extends to the importance of connecting with local farmers, skilled individuals, and like-minded people. He suggests moving away from densely populated urban areas and forming strong local communities to navigate potential challenges in the face of economic uncertainty. Farber encourages a discreet approach to discussing financial preparations, ensuring that those you trust are aware of shared values and preparedness. And, you know, the, I've, I've gotten a lot of pings on WhatsApp saying, uh, do you know any lawyers that can get them, get them out of this? Because I don't see any... I don't see any purpose to my kid going in there because, you know, well, if if there was like a, a goal that they could communicate, then maybe I would. But like, what's the point? And and then you have the the Ramat Kal, the the general chief of staff of the Israeli army, saying, "Oh, the war the war is going to last many more months. It's going to last all throughout 2024, uh, and it's it's exhausting because every day I wake up and there's more deaths, and um, and I'm I'm asking myself for what." And I just had news that that there's a, an Iranian destroyer ship heading over to the Red Sea, challenging America, who's challenging the Houthis. Things are definitely heating up, um, and it's it's not very comforting. Um, it would be if there was a goal that I could understand, but there isn't, other than just fighting. 
Uh, so I see this going on for a very long time until the money runs out. And hopefully the money runs out before some big bombs are dropped somewhere that will kill hundreds of thousands of people, God forbid. Um, and uh, that's that's what I know. It's it, it's not it's nowhere close to over. Um, Israel's not going to back down anytime soon. And uh, and Hamas are just guerrilla guerrilla warfare. So that that can keep going, as we know, guerrilla warfare never ends until until somebody gives up on the other side. But you want to know who the people are that you can trust that have what you need. If you a, a local local farmers know who they are. Um, let them know that it, it, if uh, if you know the currency doesn't work, you, they can come to you and sell you food. Uh, know who the people in your your media area are who have skills, who who uh, who have uh, you know carpentry skills. They can build things. They can fix things. Um, they're going to be very useful. And uh, get to know people who are armed and live among like-minded people. Uh, I'd say get out of cities, get out of Manhattan, get out of Chicago, get out of L.A. Uh, because when the end game hits uh, and you're stuck there, it might be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to leave. Uh, suburbs are less dangerous, but just basically know the people in your circle, make friends with them, uh, build a local community, and and you know don't go broadcasting that you have gold or silver. I mean, I'm in a special situation because this is my living. I have to tell people, so I can't really hide it. Um, but uh, talk to the people you trust talk to people with skills talk to people who have moral values um, whether those moral values come from just an innate sense of morality or from the belief in a higher being uh, those are the people you want to be around I would say like one of the safest communities is probably like Boulder, Colorado among the Mormons or the, the Amish I mean those will be the people you want to know I'm sure the Amish community will, will, will get through this pretty well and so will the, the Mormons mm-hmm.